Good morning, and welcome to this edition of Encompass Live. Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event. We cover a variety of library activities and topics. The show is free and open to anyone to watch. These one-hour sessions are held every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, normally hosted by Krista Burns, our special projects librarian, but I am filling in today. Um, they include a mixture of presentations, interviews, book reviews, web tours, mini training sessions, and pretty much anything presented by either NLC staff or guest speakers. Um, today we have a guest speaker. Mary Beth Stenger is here with us. She is the director of the Southern Area Public Library in Lost Creek, West Virginia, which was recently named Library Journal's Best Small Library in America for 2013. Take it away, Mary Beth. All right. Thank you. I'm very excited to be here. Um, as you can see, there's the Library Journal cover. That's me on the front in red. Um, what I hope to do today is something I talked about yesterday at a presentation, which is to, to help us all understand that everything that anything any library does that gets national recognition or recognition in your community helps bring all of us up um, in a big way and helps our community see that we're all vital, that libraries are vital to their community. Uh, an example I like to give is um, when that library got on NPR for the Seed uh, Library. Um, I was away at a conference at the time. I got so many emails and Facebook posts about could we have a seed library because they heard that presentation. By the time I got back from the conference, we had a seed library. I didn't have to think up that program. I didn't have to put a, put a penny of time in it. And uh, we now have a seed library all because that library came up with a creative program. So we can all raise each other up. Um, and one thing it takes and one thing it took for us to get there was a lot of passion. Not that kind of passion, although that's, that's a good kind of passion. Uh, and not this kind of passion either. But I put this slide up because I do want to talk about a kind of passion that you might um, want to guard against. A lot of small libraries are run uh, by one very dynamic person who um, has a lot of passionate ideas. And that's great. That's how you become uh, the best small library in your community and in your uh, in your state and in, in America, but um, you have to be careful. When I took over uh, as director in July, on July 1st, 2010, uh, that was a height of Twilight. Twilight series is similar to the Fifty Shades, as in some, some people are very against it. Um, usually when I show this slide, I ask how many people have Fifty Shades of Grey in their library, and most everybody will raise their hand, but I know there are some libraries that don't have it because the librarians aren't comfortable with the topic. That was the case with the Twilight series uh, in our library when I took over, even though many patrons had requested it. And I want to, uh, to try to help you guard against that, because any patron who comes in and requests a book that you say, um, we won't have in this library, any patron who comes in and says, uh, I want to learn knitting, uh, I heard about a great program, I heard about the seed library, and you just immediately say, no, that's, that's not something we can do, we don't have the staff, the facility, whatever. Any patron who comes in and is upset with one of your policies, and you don't say, let me take that under review, and instead you say, no, we're not changing that, that's our policy. That patron's going to go somewhere else, because they're going to get their needs met somewhere. And right now, in the library world, we have a lot of competition. And we want to make sure that every patron that walks through our door wants to come in again. Um, so you want to bring the right kind of passion. And that's what we were lucky enough to have a very passionate community, very passionate uh, trustee board, very passionate staff uh, to get us to where we went. Um, on our road to being the best small library, we started out as, and, and are still, the smallest library in West Virginia. Um, but we managed to gain national attention. And today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we did that, how you can do that for your library. Um, Okay, so usually when I'm at a West Virginia function and I say we're the smallest library in West Virginia, somebody likes to argue with me because uh, they have a smaller building. Um, but what I'm talking about is we are, the, we are definitely the smallest funded library in West Virginia. And I bet both, all of you already know this. Uh, if you want to talk about limitations, being the smallest funded library is, is a strong limitation on what you can do. Our tax-based income, the income we can count on year in and year out, is approximately 32000 this year. It's increased a little bit since uh, I started three years ago, but not much. From that, we pay payroll for two part-time staffs. We don't have any full-time staff. I only work 20 hours a week. Uh, we pay most of our utilities. 
time. So any math quizzes out there with pencil and paper, you know I'm making a lot less than half of that $32,000 a year. Um, but that means everything else, our books, our programming, our tech updates, anything else we want has to come from outside funding. And to get that, the fundraisers, the grants, the donations, you've got to get your community passionate about, about your library. Um, that also means, because it comes from fundraisers, grants, donations, that we can't always count on that money. Yes, tax-based funding gets, can get lower, um, especially in tough economic times, but the fundraising, the donations, they go down as well. So, but I'll, I'll tell you, um, we, you can't let a little thing like funding, a small thing like funding, bother you when you're trying to become the best library you can be. Um, I'm going to show you where we were in 2010 when I started out. I took over, um, I got hired in May, I took over in June, well I started in June, um, but I spent the entire month of June working on the summer reading program. Um, and I'm going to run through our stats and let you see a little bit about uh, where we were at that point. We had a service population of 467, that has not changed much and neither is it projected to change much in the next really 25 years. Um, but some of these other numbers will pop out to you. This is where we were, and I want you to look at them because the next slide is going to tell you where we went to in two or three years. Um, but anyway, just give me some background. When I was hired in May 2010, the board was very concerned about the upcoming summer reading program. That's something that all board members uh, know the library should have, and they weren't happy because nothing was planned for it. I have a little bit of background. I'm a homeschool mom, and my kids, of course, have gone to library programs over the years, so I knew a little bit about summer reading. Uh, but the old director handed me the big packet of the summer reading collaborative, the great big binder, hadn't even been opened yet, and said, here you go. So I had to spend the whole month of June reading that. Um, I had to plan the program, get the funding that hadn't been done yet, advertise the program. Then I spent... Uh, one day at a bigger library learning how to get us on circulation. And I'm telling you all this to let you know where we are so you can see, hopefully all of you are in a better place now, so you can certainly be in an even better place in two or three years. Um, but at the time we were, it, we are in a consortium with about 40 other libraries that um, do circulation together. We have our books in the same system, cards in the same system. And uh, we were the last library to start circulating on that. The uh, patrons had their cards in the system, but after the initial card was put in, no one was updating them, and they weren't being checked out on the system. So I had to go in and learn training because July 1, the board wanted us to get on this system when I took over as director. Um, the woman at this larger library that trained me spent about 15 minutes going over how to make new patron cards and, and realized that while I'm a CPA, I have no library training whatsoever. I've never had never even volunteered in a, in a library before behind the surf desk. I've done some other things. Um, so she gave me this very brief uh, training on how to make patron cards. That was it. For the whole year after I took over, every time someone walked in and said they wanted a patron card, uh, my heart dropped to my toes because, <laughs> you know, you've got to get all those comments right. It's kind of nerve-wracking. Uh, anyway, on July 30th, the board had a going away party for the retiring director. She handed me the keys to the P.O. box uh, where we got our mail. Uh, I didn't realize till the next day that I didn't even know which box that would be. I had to dig out some mail and figure out uh, even what our address was. And that was about the extent of my training for this library. At the same time, there, had, there was no budget. There were no financial statements prepared. There was an audit being done, um, but all the receipts were put in ziplock bags and we took that year's worth of receipts and tried to match them at the end of the year to checks. Uh, it, it was kind of a nightmare. And while this is October and it's a good time for scary stories, I'm not going to go through the whole scary story. I just want you to see where we were so you know uh, you can compare to where you are. I want you to especially look at the number of registered borrowers uh, at 892. Um, we had uh, circulation of materials at about 5,000 with a set, and it doesn't say here, but there were about 12,000 um, pieces of uh, materials to borrow in the system. That is about the only number that went down. It went down to 11,000 over the three years I was there because um, there was so much mold 
in the library. There were books in the elementary section so tight together that uh, a child could not pull out a book to see, you know, a kid wants to see the front of a book before they're going to choose it. You couldn't get the books out. In the adult uh, fiction section, any new books, uh, especially in the inspiration section, which was something that um, that particular director really loved, so there was a lot of new books in that section. Uh, the new books were being put in front of the stack because there's no room to put them inside the stack. So there were just too many, too much material. Um, just taking out the weed alone, though, got, got rid of about, a, I mean, for a mold alone, got rid of about a thousand uh, pieces of material, which was a shame. Um, but at least it got us down to where the uh, patrons could look through the books in a more comfortable level. Um, Library visits at that time when I took over were about 3,000 a year, and then I think the number that really uh, put us over at the top in this particular uh, award was when I took over there were 28 programs the year before with uh, attendance of 299, which it's nice attendance, that's about 10, 10 people on average per program, but 28 programs is not very many programs, especially when you consider that most of that it was probably the previous year summer reading. Um, there was a genealogy group that completely met on its own, um, that did use the library, and, and I think she was counting that. Um, and a book discussion group that, when, when I said I did volunteer a little bit, that's what I did. I led the book discussion group uh, once a month, and we usually got six and eight people uh, that came to that a month. So that accounted for most of the programs, in fact, probably all the programs. There was no Facebook page when I took over, no Twitter account, no Pinterest account. The web page was just a minimal uh, information. There was no even brochure to hand out to people uh, when they came and joined our library and wanted to learn more about it. So that's where we were. Um, you should get your statistics together and try to figure out where you are, and I'm hoping your readers uh, look even better than that. I hope you're in a better condition so that when you start working on becoming the best small library you can be, um, you'll, your numbers are going to pop even, even better than this. And this is where we, what the committee saw. This is what we did in, in two years. Um, I've been there three years now, but in the two years that the award covered. Uh, this particular award does look at, at what you've done over the last couple of years. A lot of people think you have to go from terrible to uh, great that's not necessarily so. You, you can go from a program that you built up, uh, say a collaborative effort that went from no collaborations to a lot of great collaboration. You don't have to start at the bottom like we did. But anyway, we did and uh, we changed. Our registered borrowers, as you can see, went up about 100 a year. We're still getting um, about 75 new borrowers at least a year. That to me is significant because, as I said, we're in a consortium for our patron cards. So that means any other library, and there's over 40, that has already given some card, when that person, when that someone walks into our library, we don't get to give them a new card. Um, there's another library in our county that they're not in the consortium, so if our patron walks in their library, they, they get to count them as their patron too. Um, this is just brand new people who have never had a library card walking into my library. And, and honestly, in our little community of 496, I don't know how we're averaging 75 to 100 new people every year, but, but we are, and it's exciting. Um, I hope we do keep doing that. Uh, let's see, so I talked about getting down the materials. Um, one of the most uh, significant changes you see there, we went from 3,000, uh, approximately 3,000 libraries of visits to almost 8,000. I really wanted to break 8,000 this year. We didn't. We still stayed around 7,900. Um, one of my uh, just fun things I'd like to do is, is say, it's called break 100 and try to get 100 people in the library in one day. We got almost that many people last year when we celebrated um, our award. So I'd really like to see us get, um, or no, I think it was the day we took pictures for our award. But anyway, I'd really like to see us break 100 one day. But that, that lets you know how small we are. We've never broke 100 in one day. And that might get us over that 8,000 library visits. But we significantly increased our library visits. But the number that really popped out for people, that everyone talked about, that um, saw these two uh, figures, these two uh, sets of data, 
is, of course, the program. We increased the program by, I think, 888 percent or something I've forgotten, and I don't have it written down here, unfortunately, but you can see we went um, from 28 programs to 227 programs. Uh, and that, at the time, we have two staff now. Uh, at the time, it was pretty much just me. Uh, I did have an assistant, but she only came after school. So it, it was tough. It, we weren't as busy when I first took over, so I could often lead programs. I led the computer uh, instruction class while working the surf desk. So those things are possible. It's hard. Um, now that we're so busy, it's not something I can do. But as you get busier, you get more people excited. Uh, we now have a guy that wants to teach our computer class. So he comes and he teaches it, and I don't have to. And in fact, he's so enthusiastic, he, we call him our tech guy, and he pretty much fixes our computers for us, even though the state will come in and do that. He does a lot of the little stuff, so we don't have to wait for the state. And he's gotten the reputation in the community where people will bring their computers or call him to come over to their house to fix them, and uh, bless him, he does it for free. So, <laughs> a lot of times. So, um, we did, we tried it. Uh, any and every program I could think of. Um, our program attendance obviously went way up uh, with the number of programs. We got a Facebook page, we got a Pinterest account. Um, I updated the website when I first took over, and I've updated it uh, again this year. When I say I updated it this summer, uh, actually it was a collaborative effort, effort, and that's something that I think is the new exciting area in libraries. And I hope that nothing else that you take away from this presentation is that you go out there and try to figure out some collaborations. For my website, I was at a state conference last year, and I went to lunch with a uh, young lady, um, Kathy, Kathy Clevenger. She is at the big library in our county, and she has redone the website, done a fantastic job, and I was um, congratulating her on that. And while I was congratulating her, I said, uh, is there any way um, you could maybe redo our website. I said, you could probably do it in half the time. I could do it, but it would take me a lot of time. I'd have to brush up on my HTML all over again. Uh, is there any way you'd be willing to do it? And they do have what's called a service affiliate agreement, which is something unique, I think, to West Virginia, where bigger libraries try to help small libraries that um, have directors that don't have MLS degrees. So um, she's getting, getting paid through the state to, to help us out a little bit. And she said, yes, she put a great website together. But it was through that partnership that we were able to get a better website than I could have put together and saved my time that I would have to spend putting that together. So um, I think collaboration, because let's face it, if you're a small library, and I assume if you're listening to this, you are probably a small library, um, we have limitations. We certainly have the funding limitations, but we also have some others. And, uh, that's what this next slide is going to show you. This is one of our limitations. Bless it. it that's our building. Um, last, well, a couple weeks ago now, I was at our community annual fall festival. Uh, we have a book sale during that time. We have our annual book sale. We don't make a lot of money at it. Um, probably by the time I pay the staff the person to be there, we might lose a little bit of money. But it gives us a chance to get out in the community. Uh, talk about our programming, just show that we're part of our community. It gives us a chance to get rid of all those books that people want to donate to us over the years, year that uh, we don't have anything to do with. So anyway, I was sitting there and a 90-year-old woman came about and wanted to talk about the library. And she said she was a former magistrate in our, in our town. We don't have magistrates anymore, they're all the county seat, but at that time we did, back when she was young. And she said, she allowed her chambers, her magistrate chambers, to be used for the first library. They had to have some place called their own space to get a grant. So they called her chambers the uh, library, and they got a grant. And the Southern Area Library has been used as space, hard spaces and leftover buildings ever since then. Um, I think the next building is the Odd Fellows Building, then a room in the community building. Both sites, I believe, were flooded out with uh, pretty much all the books ruined right now, I remember. Being one time $50,000 worth of damage to the library contents for one of those floods. Then in 1985, the local bank, um, which is unusual for community our size, we were lucky we have a bank that's been there since 1910. This building was built in 1910. Um, but the local bank decided to build themselves a new building, and they gave the old building to the library. Got us out of the flood zone pretty much, luckily, so we shouldn't have any more uh, flood damage. 
and we got so we got this like, beautiful old building. Um, and of course, it was built in 1910. The former director and the president and friends did a wonderful job getting the grant. Got the um, bricks uh, rebricked to, to, to shore up the uh, building, which was wonderful. The windows and the doors, we got a grant when I first took over to get all those new. We had a lot of energy leakage. Um, for the longest time, the old bank, great big marble teller station was still in there. People had to walk sideways through the stacks if you were carrying your child because the stacks were so tight together. All that's fixed. It's beautiful when you walk in there now, um, all through grants. But we still have our building limitations. Our children's programs have been upstairs in the hallway. It's a wide hallway. I'll give you that. But it's still a hallway. We recently got it painted. Um, painted the cheap paneling to try to give it a little bit of pop. We have a carpenter in there that does a lot of work for us and he put up bulletin and boards so we can display the children's artwork without room in the walls. Uh, we created one of the first things we did when I took over when we created it. We did it used to be the nice kitchen area. We have some great comfortable chairs up there. People can take our Wi-Fi access up there and sit on their laptop. And one of our future things we're hoping to do, there's a boardroom up there. It's got a lot of genealogy stuff in there. Uh, which gets used, but not as frequently as I'd like, so I'd like to put a team gaming area up there. But of course, we've got to get money for that other limitation right there. Uh, there was no director's office until I took over. Uh, there was a room that they were using for tutoring children. I prefer the kids to be tutored out there in the hall in an open space. I think it's safer for our tutors. Um, it just lets them be out in the open instead of an enclosed space with this young students, so I changed that into a director's office, and as a CPA, I'm a lot more comfortable going up there and doing all the financials um, in, in the privacy of an office instead of having a bank statement laying all over the surf desk like I had to do the first year. Um, but last year, I had to tell our board that given our calendar, given our space, given our limited staff, we had as many programs as we could possibly handle. Um, and that's where that collaboration, that's, yes, the building is a limitation. Yes, this next slide is going to show you another limitation. And it's not me and Wilma, that's my uh, assistant on the right, my very great assistant, Wilma Bennett. Um, we're, not, we're not the limitation, but the number is the limitation. Uh, having only two staff members, having a small building, obviously uh, limits us. So the next thing we're going to do, and we're going to share that, even though that has nothing to do with winning the award, but um, we're going to get outside the building as much as we can. And one thing we're really pushing for this year, we have an elementary school in our community. It's just, you can, you can actually walk to it if you wanted to. Um, we're trying to do a lot more with them. We're going to take some of our programs over to them. First of all, kids are really busy in the evening. It's hard to get them into your library because they have other things to do. So we're going to go to the kids during the day. Um, Wilma goes over there. We give uh, one free movie tickets to the teachers to give to the kids for incentives in their classroom, and then they can come and watch a movie at our library. So we went last year. We had these same movies. Um, you didn't have to have a ticket. Anyone could come. We couldn't get anybody to come. This year we have the incentive tickets over at the school, and we're averaging about a dozen kids um, every month. So. It makes a difference. These collaborative efforts can make a difference. Um, certainly, a two-person staff can be a limit, a limitation. But if you're bringing that passion, and one of our passions, both Wilma and I, are, is to bring a sense of friendliness to our library. I can't tell you the number of people that come into our library that say that they like because we're nice. Um, in fact, I was as a, a I gave us a talk on Geek the Library, which if you're not doing Geek the Library, I can give you a little, a little two minutes feel on that too. It's a great program. Um, but I was doing a talk on that, and somebody came up and said that their friend who lived in a whole other county comes to our library because we're nice. And we have that all the time um, from all kinds of other libraries. And folks, being nice is free. Uh, being nice, it doesn't matter how big the building is, it doesn't matter how many staff members. We try to say hi to everybody that comes in, and we try never to say no. We try to give people a break. We don't have fines for overdue um, because we do have a small, poor, rural community. Sometimes people don't even have the transportation to get the book back 
time. So it's, it's you know, they're, they're doing the best they can, so we don't charge for that. If they lose a book or damage a book, we even try to work with that type. It's not necessarily charging them replacement value, but current value. So, um, you know, your staff can be a limitation if you don't have enough staff and we don't, but it, it can also be the best asset. And in our case, in a certain diploma, um, our staff is limited. Okay, this is some of the programming we had. I'm going to run through it. But first, I always like to ask everybody, and I hope you put in the chat box or if she unmutes the button for you, tell me some kind of unique programming that you have at your library. And I like to ask this question for two reasons. I, I want us all to know that we are, um, we're all doing our best to have the best small libraries. But I also like to steal all your programming, great programming ideas if I can get them. So if anybody wants to type in a, a programming idea, I'd love to hear it. Come on, so. <laughs> That's an excellent <laughs> idea to steal other people's <laughs> idea. <laughs> so. Yes. Well, uh, we all got some good ideas here. Let's see, we have okay. one person writing in that they have a Newton Linux user group, a ham radio group, and an Arduino group. Ham radio, that's really interesting. Yeah, that sounds cool. Let's see, someone says they have a summer book van program where we deliver books to individual homes. That sounds exciting. Oh, wow, yeah. Anybody else? I have a friend in Utah that runs the library, uh, Garland Public Library, and I was just looking at some of the things she does, and she puts books out um, in their different businesses, uh, books they don't need anymore, with a little bookmark that says, um, free book courtesy of Garland Public Library. Oh, well, that's a great idea. Isn't that a great idea? Good you know, we all get, Yeah, we all get so many books donated that are in great condition, but you already have a copy in the library and just don't need it for some reason, you know. Um, so that's a great thing to do. Uh, anyone who, who didn't speak up, I want to say that part of being the best small library is self-promoting. And some people think that's a dirty word or networking is a dirty word, but it's not because you're not just helping yourself when you say, hey, I have this great program. You're helping other libraries too. You're showing the community that you're a vital force in your community. They're starting to think positive about libraries. They think libraries are the place to go to get community. And because of that, then, then they see a value in libraries and they're helping fund all of us. So don't be afraid to um, let everyone know what's great about your library. I sat through, uh, gave this talk before, and at that time I could point everybody out um, and made everybody tell me a program. I can't do that to all of you guys. And one person, when I got to them, shook their head, no, they didn't have a program. Later on in the speech, it happened to come out that they had a Lego robotics team at their library. Now, folks, if that's not a fun program, I don't know what it is. So obviously they had a fun program, um, but they were, they were embarrassed to promote themselves. Don't do that. That's part of your job, marketing, which is where the geek comes in. If you're uncomfortable with marketing, try to get in on this geek the library. Uh, at geekthelibrary.org. It's a great program, and I know that their enrollment is almost up, so um, it's going to be first come, first served, and there's not a whole lot left. So, so take, a, take advantage of that if you can. Um, one of our unique programs, and one of the ones, if you went back to our cover, you saw it said, Little Library with a Big Heart. Um, at the same time that I was trying to get this award, we were launching our Big Heart campaign. And that's something that's pretty unique to us, but also, once I started it, something I saw other libraries picking up. And it's exciting for me because this is part of my passion. I really like helping the community. I like to help the underserved, and that's what this does. How the Big, Camp, Big Heart Campaign works, and a lot of people usually want me to explain it because it's, it's a little hard to understand until I go through the examples. Every month, the library picks um, a different charitable organization or charitable activity to sponsor. The library didn't spend any money. Uh, we really don't spend any staff time. We might decorate a box to put the collections in. Um, usually we ask the charity to come over and pick it up themselves so that A, they can see the library and B, you don't have to spend staff time going over there and doing it. Um, what some of the things we've done, this is October, we do a trick or treat for UNICEF. So we have the little boxes. Anybody can come to the box and collect money from UNICEF. We don't get a lot, but it helps our kids learn about 
the troublesome world, and it helps them feel like they're making a difference when their trick or treat is being set. In, in November, um, we started November last year, October, November last year, um, so we've run through one fiscal year. Some of the ones we're changing, November is one of the ones we're changing. Uh, well, let me backtrack to September, because that's the beginning, what I consider the beginning of our year. So in September, what we did was we collected school supplies uh, for the local elementary school. We donated it to the school. We let the teachers decide if they want to keep it in the classroom, or do they want to donate it to a uh, child, say that that's a, they know that child doesn't have any pencils at home, but they can home work. They can send it a box of pencils somewhere. Um, so that's a way to start a collaboration with our elementary and we're kind of killing two birds with one stone. We're doing those collaborative programs there and we're also um, showing that we care about our community by donating these things. And of course the, it's our patrons donating these things, so it's drawing people in, getting them excited about the library. Um, in October, like I said, we did UNICEF. In November this year, our fiber arts addicts uh, club has been wanting to knit things for someone, so we're going, what we're doing is knitting uh, scarves, hats, gloves, um, and going to donate it to that same elementary school. A lot of times the kids come, uh, especially in the beginning of winter, they're not dressed for the weather. They have to go home uh, without adequate clothing and then go away from the bus. This way they can take home some hats and scarves and gloves that are homemade, knitted, they're not just uh, something somebody discarded, but something special that they can keep and uh, really lift up that child. And those are the kind of things that I'm passionate about and that we're able to bring up to the library. Uh, December we do the Humane Society. January is one of the things that brings the most people in. Um, it's the whole community excited. We have what's called Birthday in the Box. There is a mission, um, a homeless shelter in our county, it's not in our city, but we, we don't limit our charitable things to our city. Um, and what we do is patrons bring in all kinds of birthday things that you might do for a child's birthday, streamers, balloons. Uh, we also work with the mission and they're going to, uh, we could bring in cake mixes and, and icing because they're allowing the parents to make that child's cake and the mission's oven. Um, um, bring in the little trinkets, you know, that you give out in birthday parties. All those things got dumped in the box. And my, this is the one where my staff member and I did uh, donate some time. We got shoe boxes also donated by patrons. We wrapped those in um, really colorful pa uh, wrapping paper, birthday wrapping paper, also donated by the patrons. And we made a birthday in each box. And then we took those to the mission where they came and picked them up. And uh, when a child is living, a homeless child is living at the shelter uh, over their birthday, the mission staff can take that box and you know, give that child a birthday party. The parents can give them a birthday party even if they're homeless. And that really resonated with a lot of people who, throughout the community and also, honestly, throughout the nation. It's a very greenest program we have in January. February, um, we did love letters. There's a website about that. Um, we uh, work with and did that. In March, we do a similar thing to the uh, party in the box for the domestic violence shelter, but it's not a birthday party. Um, we send up uh, care boxes to the women with maybe uh, shampoo, new toothbrushes, a puzzle book, you know, something that those women can have when there is the domestic violence shelter. That's a whole county away, but it's something we want to do to help those women. In, um, April, if that's Child Abuse Awareness Month, um, we donate lot of uh, live, <laughs> yeah, live animals. No, not live animals, stuffed animals, uh, brand new stuffed animals to the Agnesin group that does forensic interviews with these children. So that during the interviews, they can have this um, stuffed animal to live and, and, and hug on to them. They can take that home and have that stuffed animal uh, for themselves. And that, that got a Really nice turnout with our patrons. In May, there was a forest that um, wanted someone to collaborate with them. Um, they had the heart, they wanted to give flowers to every woman in any nursing homes. And they donated a lot of their time and money, but they couldn't donate the whole amount of the flower. It was just too much for that little force to do. So we collected money and we helped with that campaign. And then throughout the summer months, just to give our staff a break, and me a break, <laughs> we have just one fundraiser. And also to draw um, the idea that the summer is summer reading, summer programming, all together. 
and we call it change for change. And we collect change and uh, patrons can have a little bit of fun guessing how much change is going to be in there at the end of the summer. Whoever guesses the closest, they get to donate that change to the charity of their choice. Um, with the only caveat being I have to okay it because I don't want the charity of their choice to be themselves. <laughs> but other than that, and this year was our first year to do that, it actually ended up being a win-win for us because the person who won their charity of choice was the library. So we actually got that, that money. Um, so anyway, that's some of our programming that uh, the committee already saw. This is some of our funding. Now, I didn't send that particular slide um, or that pie chart to the uh, end with my narrative, but it gives you an idea of where small libraries funding is coming from. 82% of ours is tax-based, but it's not a lot of money. It's only, I guess, like 32000 What I would like to see is that percentage decrease. Obviously, I don't want to see the 32000 decrease, but I would like to see only half of our money coming from that tax base and half of it coming from donations and fundraisers and uh, grants, etc. So that's kind of a goal we have, is to decrease the percentage of funding this tax base because it is so fixed. I mean, if you're lucky, it's fixed. If you're unlucky, it's going down. But it's hardly ever going up. Um, but you can get your donations and your grants and that kind of thing up. And I think that's part of what the community is interested in was our fundraising and some of our, I'm just going to put all the programs up together. And then I'll go through them a little bit. We have a couple of unique ones. Uh, I already talked about the book sale. The flower sale is, is not unique. That was something the friends really wanted to do, so I just let them go with that. Adopt a book is something that the president of our friends group came up with. It works similar to um, Adopt an Angel. At Christmas, we put uh, book titles on a tree, and people can adopt to buy that book for us. And uh, it's the only way we pay for our adult nonfiction. Our book budget is less than $4,000 a year. Um, that's for every piece of material we buy. And we simply don't have money for adult nonfiction. We don't get enough turnover in adult nonfiction to use that $4,000 on adult nonfiction. So we couldn't get any new books except for those that are donated unless we have this fundraiser. Last year we had about $400 worth of books we asked for. We got all $400 worth of books. This year we have 50 books on the list. We just put the list out and I'm very excited. I'd like to see. I'm hoping we'll get every book. Um, the trustee 1010 is something new we did this year, but it was put in the narrative that we were going to do that. Um, it didn't work as well as we hoped, so we're going to have to see it, which is something we have to think about whenever you're doing anything. It's, it's very easy, and I can see this after I've been here three years, the same thing, you get in these little bluffs, this is how we do it, and that's how we're always going to do it, even if it's not working. Um, but you have to reevaluate your future. Even if you're not a big numbers person, still you kind of have a feel for whether a program is successful. Um, we look at it, figure it out, get rid of it, dump it. We're not going to dump the trusty tin tin at this point, but we are going to do it. And what it was originally, it's something I got out of the book. You get 10 people to get 10 people to donate money, to donate $10. <laughs> And we, we were really hoping to get 20 people to get 10 people and raise about $2,000. We didn't do that. We raised about 500 um, which is still a, a nice chunk, but it's not what we were hoping for. Um, a lot of the trustees and the friends groups that did the tickets were not comfortable asking people to, to buy a ticket when they weren't getting anything. We really wanted a raffle prize. So this year we're going to um, see if we can't get a tablet or something so they can say that you're buying a ticket to get a chance to win this tablet. Um, it's not quite the spirit of the, the fundraiser that was in the book, but you have to go with what works in the community and think this might work a little better if we have a prize at the end of the road. Not so much to get the people to donate the $10, because they seem happy to donate whoever was asked, but to get the people who were selling the tickets, they weren't comfortable selling them without a prize at the end. So you have to, you have to really look at things. A taste of soup is something that um, I actually stole. We talk about stealing pro uh, program ideas. You can also steal fundraising ideas. I stole this taste of soup from someone at um, the conference, the Arsenal Conference. That's the Association for World Small Libraries. If you're not a member, I highly recommend it. Um, it's based on how much you make. So I only pay $8 
dollars a year to be a member, which shows how much I don't make, but uh, that's okay. Um, but uh, somebody I, I set in at this Arsenal conference, they have all these great workshops on what works for small libraries, and they have this a thing called signature events. I was trying to push a signature event with my friends group. I couldn't get them. They, they kept saying they were too small. They wanted to do flower sales, uh, things like that. And I only raised a couple hundred dollars. It was driving me crazy. Um, I came back from this Arsenal conference with this great idea that, as I say, I totally lifted from someone else. At this year's Arsenal conference, when I gave the same talk, she came up and said, hey, I'm the person you stole that from. Uh, yeah, I did. I did that. Um, but anyway, it's a fundraiser. We had it in January, um, and we made fifteen hundred dollars. We were sold out. We couldn't have we couldn't have had another person sit down at the table. It's really better than just simply wasn't room. It was crazy how how popular it was. And in fact, people who didn't come came up to us and said, "We're well, going to have another one because I want to do it." Uh, so we are also tweaking it. There were so, there were people that said they wanted to make soup, so we're going to open up that. And if you're curious about exactly what case the soup is, um, you know, just pop a question in there and I'll go into it in more detail. So you can steal the idea too. Um, but the point is, um, you can come up with some successful fundraisers that work in the community and try to get that uh, money up and over. Because you can't just rely on tax dollars. First of all, they're decreasing. Second of all, they're very set. Third of all, by having something like case the soup, it gets the whole library excited about the community. When we had this taste of soup, um, we invited obviously our funding partners, city council. From that and from um, the Geek the Library program, going to them about funding with that, um, we had a city councilman come up to us and say he has a band and he's going to uh, do a fundraiser for us, have a band concert, and everybody that comes and all the money he raises is going to the library. That would have never happened if we weren't out there talking to the community, if we weren't out there having this uh, community life. Fundraiser, so these things multiply. Okay, why did we win? Um, one of the judges was also the guy that wrote the article, um, John Barry, and he gave me a little insight into uh, what some of the judges were talking about. One of the things they were most excited about was their use of technology. Um, we did, I do embrace new things. We were the first library in West Virginia to get to the library, which I've mentioned several times if you haven't heard about it. Feel free to send me an email, and I, I'll be happy to talk to you about the Library for anyone. I love people Library. Um, but uh, because we are embracing these new things, and you have to be seen as a vital, changing, exciting part of the community. If you always do what you've always done, you'll always be, or you always were, or something to that effect is the saying, right? And you don't want to be seen as that thing. Libraries already have that stodgy image that we, we, I think we're overthrowing quite well, actually, but it's still there. Um, at the presentation I was at yesterday, the, the speaker before me said something about uh, they were doing this fundraiser at some library and somebody wanted everyone to go, shh, as a joke, you know, because you have to be quiet in libraries and the library was four or five, no, that's not how libraries are anymore. So, you know, you want to, you want to be seen as vital and important to your community. Um, anyway, so we try to adopt a lot of new things. I do want to say something. I think most of us realize that just being a book lender isn't a libraries anymore. But I think we're um, also a little bit off the beaten track thinking that being a place where people can get the internet is going to save us because I've seen just in my library when I first started there were people that came, that came every day and sat on our computers to get on the internet. They now have internet in their homes. And I don't know about you, but I carry my computer in my pocket. It's called my iPhone. Um, I don't need to go to the library to get on, on the internet. So we can't stop. We can't say, well, now that's all the problem. Uh, people will use this for um, a Wi-Fi cafe and the internet cafe. No, you, you have to keep reinventing yourself. You have to keep working for new programming. You have to keep your community support and get out in the community and find out what they need and what they want you to do for them. Um, I, why I think we won, quite honestly, is what I started with, which is the passion. All these other things are important, but um, not just my passion, which I do have a great passion for the library, and this is just a little life tip, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit talking uh, really quick so people can ask questions. But um, if you're not passionate about your job, 
you will find another in life short folks. And uh, you should be excited when you should be driving every, every day that you go in uh, if you can. Because uh, we're life short and it just our jobs are an important part of our lives and we should be having a lot of fun doing it. Um, so I think our passion is, is why we run. But certainly uh, our commitment, the community's commitment, the community support, the fact that we embrace technology and our willingness to try new things. But all that is surrounded by our passion. My passion and my sister's passion. Wilma Bennett, um, she's incredible. I can't say that enough. She comes in even on her days off. I have to have a special room to just push her out of the uh, building in the end of the day. That's, that's not true, but <laughs> it's about like that. Um, she loves, she loves our library. Okay, uh, we have a lot of things up next. I'm not going to go through all that because I really would like to get to questions, but I just want to say collaboration. That's what's up next for us and the next what should be up next for you. I think that is where everything's going in the library world. The more we collaborate with other things in the community, the less we have to invent, the less um, the staff you have to use up, the less resources, the less new building that you have to use up. For those of you who do want to try to win Festival Library, um, here is the link. It can be hard to find the narrative, and here's what we're going to be expected to do. It is due in November, so you might want to work, wait and work for next year. I heard about it a year before I even did it. Um, it's not really that hard. Somebody came up to me at the last Arsenal conference in Omaha and said, oh, it's a lot of work. And uh, I thought they meant after you win. That's when a lot of work is. I'm pretty exhausted from that. But, but this stuff before, it really, they understand that we're small libraries. They don't expect it to be some really polished, you know, wow thing. They just want to hear the wow stuff you're doing in the community. Okay, I think that's it for me if you want to turn it back to questions. Great. Thank you. Um, we did have a couple of questions come in. One person asked, you know, when you were talking about stealing programming ideas, um, <laughs> one person asked, we have had issues in the past attracting our local homeschool groups. Would you happen to have any recommendations for attracting and keeping homeschool groups? Is that something you've explored? Uh, it, it has. It is actually, in fact, when I took over, I actually homeschool. I used to be state homeschooling president. Um, so that is near and dear to my heart. I homeschooled all three of my sons, and I am still, while working, homeschooling my 10-year-old girl. So I'm still part of that. I'm not as big a part of the community because I don't have time. Honestly, I'm, I couldn't possibly be state homeschooling resident and work too. It would be crazy. But um, when I took over, that's one of the things I told the trustee, actually even in my interview, that I wanted us to be the homeschooling library because, quite honestly, as a homeschooler, as somebody who wasn't uh, you know, in, in library work at all, I could tell you homeschoolers felt unwelcome to library. Um, we reached out to libraries several times to try to get them to do programming for us. Uh, we had, obviously we have older than preschool kids and we tried to do something with one of our local libraries and what they ended up presenting to us was a preschool program and we had kids 10 and 11 who were bored stiff. Um, so I knew that there was a need out there and there is a need out there. The best thing to do is probably find a couple of movers and shakers in your homeschool community. Um, and try to see what they need, what, what organizations they're in. Um, if, if you don't know or you don't know any of the local homeschoolers, um, there are state organizations which you could certainly find a website for. You can get in their newsletter. Believe me, um, homeschool newsletters are always looking at all. Oh, uh, I used to freelance for the local newspaper and magazines. Everybody's looking for copy. Um, Put in your uh, library program and I'll often send that to our state homeschooling group. Uh, there's lots of ways to reach out to them. Let them know that you want to be the homeschool library in your area. And, and they'll come. Great. Well, that sounds encouraging. Um, our other question that came in was working the opposite direction on stealing ideas. They would like to take you up on your offer to share more information about Taste of Soup since it sounds like it was a great success for you. It was, and it was a great success for the person I stole it from, too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's worked, it's worked at least twice. Um, what that is, uh, is the first year we had just the friends and the trustees do it, but each person makes about two gallons worth of soup, um, and then you um, come and you have these eight or ten you know, tables worth of soup. People buy a ticket, so you know ahead of time how, much, uh, how many people are coming. 
sell the tickets ahead of time, they come and they get just a little like cup of soup to try each soup. Okay, so you've sold your tickets, then beside each soup you have a jar where they vote on their favorite soup. Um, so you get a little bit more money that way. I didn't think we'd get much money that way, but it was just funny because uh, people, some of the women that cook soup, their husbands wanted them to win to help, you know, make them feel good about their cooking. <laughs> so they would put $25 checks in there. So we actually raised a lot of money with the voting uh, for, the, for your favorite soup. Um, we also added a little uh, different mix. This, this idea we did not steal. We came up with ourselves, so you're welcome to steal. We uh, invited local authors. One of our friends members came up with this idea. Um, and that gets, you know, the chance for the local, this is another collaborative thing. We're helping the local authors. They get to come in, they get to peddle their books, talk to people about the books. We don't charge them for their table. That's not a way we're making money. They, in turn, um, donated a copy of the books to the library. Plus, it makes, uh, we kind of had free entertainment at our event because people could go around and talk to these uh, offer. So it, it was a win-win for everybody. We also, besides having the trustees and uh, friends make the soup, we got Bob Evans to donate some soup and we got Panera Bread. If you have a Panera Bread in your area, they will actually, at the end of the night, any bread that they have, any bread products, they will donate to local organizations. So we went Saturday night, our thing was on Sunday. Saturday night we went and got, they put it in garbage bags, which is kind of gross, but we got two or three garbage bags full of bread products. And they were very popular at the event, and they're only a day old, and it was for free. So that's something else you can do with it. Something we're going to do this year is there were a lot of community members that said they would like to make some soup. Um, so we're going to have a little contest. They can win like a $25 gift certificate or something if their soup is picked as the winner. Um, something the other group that did the Taste of Soup uh, not our library, but the one of Solicum, uh, did the winning soup got to uh, um, present the same soup the next year. That almost seems like a losing thing because it's really a lot of work to make two gallons of soup. <laughs> so I'm not sure that's winning anything, but I guess it got, you know, they were excited that they won. But anyway, um, uh, that's what it is, and it doesn't really take any money or time from the library. We're lucky that there's a community building that um, because the city council is our funding agent, one of the things they've agreed to is that we can use their building at least two times a year. We use it for summer reading in case of soup. But honestly, I think they'd let us use it more if we needed it. Um, so we get the building free. Uh, so it doesn't cost us a penny. And it was a, the, the great thing, besides the fact that it raised $1,500, which was wonderful, obviously, the great thing was how it brought the community together and made the community feel like they were supporting their library. How many people came up after and said, Oh, I'll donate books, or oh, I'll, you know, they realized we needed them, and they wanted to be there for us, and uh, it's really made a difference in their minds. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of follow-up questions on that coming in. Um, one of them you just answered. They asked if it was hosted at the library, and that was great that you had a space to use the community building. Um, someone else wants to know how much did you charge for the tickets to this event? Okay, that was a point of contention with uh, the friends and myself. <laughs> the um, person that I took it from, I think they charged 10 or 12, I can't remember. The uh, friends did not think, first of all, uh, the president of the friends group thought the whole thing was crazy. Nobody's, nobody <laughs> likes soups. She said, nobody likes soup and nobody's going to want to come taste just a little bit of it. So she was not too crazy about the whole idea. Um, but she won for best soup. She had chili. So, uh, you know, I think she'll be more enthusiastic next year. But um, so we only charged $8 a ticket, I believe. Um, somebody else wrote up the tickets, not me, so I can't remember off the top of my head that well. But I think it was $8 a ticket. Um, one thing that helped us get to that 1500 was not just uh, the fact that we sold those tickets, but because the community was all there and we're talking about funding and we're talking about library support, some people actually, like I said, some people voted uh, on their wife's things by giving $25 checks, but also some people donated some one road check for, I think, $150 just to donate to the library while they were there. And um, this person is certainly aware of the library, but I don't think he would have popped in to give us a $150 check. He did it because we were there and having this event. So it helps in a lot of different ways. 
Absolutely. That's very important. Um, one more detail people are curious about. What day of the week and time did you have the Taste of Soup event? Okay. We had we have a little uh, church right behind us where actually our, our patrons um, park. <laughs> so, as, and then a lot of our friends actually go to that church. They felt it would be uh, an advantage to us to have it on Sunday right after church let out. Well, actually, church lets out at noon. They wanted to have it, I think, at 1 o'clock or 12.30 or something. But this year we're going to have it immediately after church because that's when people came. We had a line of people ready to eat the minute church let out. So so now we're, we're starting immediately after church. But we did have it on Sundays around noon. Um, we had it for two hours with our feelings. And see, this is why you never know what you're going to get. We thought people would struggle in throughout the two hours. No, everybody came at noon. <laughs> That was tough. So everybody had to fit in this space uh, at once. Nobody straggled in hardly. Um, I might, the people I sell tickets to, I might tell them, come late next time. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get, so you do it. But that's why it's great to have the same thing um, year after year. You can keep improving on it. And that's Absolutely. Great. That's great. Well, on a different subject, we have one last question that has come in, and anybody else who has questions, please feel free to go ahead and submit them while we're talking about this one. Um, this question says, we have a hard time attracting people to come to our programs. We advertise in the newspaper, on our Facebook, and hang flyers at community locations. We have people say they are interested, but then have very few people, or even no one, come in. Any advice on how you lure people to come in for your programs? I, I just want to tell you, we're all there. We all. Every time I bring this up, or any time I'm with a bunch of librarians, we have that same problem. And, and, um, and in fact, I've had programs that other people said they wanted. And, and I'll, I'll go to all the trouble to put them together, and, and even that person doesn't come. <laughs> and you just kind of go, ah! So that's one reason we're doing this, starting this collaborative stuff. We're taking our children's program to the grade school. Hey, we have 20, if, if I go into the second grade, I've got 25 kids who can't get out of their desk. They're stuck. <laughs> they're stuck <laughs> in my program. And because I come here and they get to meet the librarian, then they're going to feel more comfortable maybe coming down and getting a book or something like that. Um, and we also are going to try to take it, uh, some of our craft programming for adults out to the CEOSs and that kind of thing, um, which if you don't know, that's just women's group. That's something West Virginia has. Um, but take some of our programming out to other groups. They're always looking for programming ideas. We can provide some of that programming and go to them instead of trying to get the people in there. I think especially when you're a small library, our library hours are limited. We close at 6 o'clock. Um, it's hard for us to ha have programming that people want to come to the library for, so we're going to try to go go to them. I did mention, and I'm just going to mention it again um, in case you missed it, sometimes just tweaking your program. For example, that movie, uh, Afternoons that we were having for kids, when we just advertised it in those ways that this person mentioned, Facebook flyers, etc. We, we honestly, it was my daughter and my staff's daughter that came to the movies last year, and that was it. Uh, we just couldn't get anybody. I, I had already decided that I was going to quit having a movie license. I was ready to quit having it this year and because it cost us $160 a year. And I decided one more time, I'm going to try one more thing. And we um, started giving these incentive tickets to, this, to the teachers uh, to give out. They, can, they get to pick. They want to give it to the best student, the most improved student, the student that needs the most encouragement. We don't care who they give it to. They can give it to whoever they want. We give the tickets out to kids who come in. I, I was sitting in the library uh, doing something, and I saw uh, my assistant, Wilma, get up, and she, she told these two kids, it was almost closing this time, she said, you've been so good today and so quiet. Here are two tickets to our, our movie, so that they felt like they had won something by having good behavior. <laughs> but really, anybody could come. It's just like last year. But, you know, because they think it's an award, we're, we're now averaging, I'm not, I'm not uh, exaggerating, 12 12 kids a, uh, a movie, and, and all we did was we, we make you have a ticket now. <laughs> so, so you don't know. Don't give up. Keep tweaking. Um, and keep, you know, keep, keep looking out there and finding out what other people are doing. But I think this is a problem that everybody's having because people are so busy. I know with my own daughter, we have soccer almost every night. I wouldn't have time to get her to library programs if I wasn't already in the library. So it's tough. It is. Yeah, great, that's a good point. And actually, we have a question or a comment coming in along those lines of tweaking things. Um, someone in our audience says that they're 
attendance at their basic technology programs went down, so they moved to one-on-one -on -one tech question time from 3 to 5, open for anybody to just come in and ask any question. It says the jury is still out, but it may have helped. Yes, yes, that is a fabulous idea. We did a similar thing with, I had, um, when you see that, 227 programs. I had a resume uh, creation program, job application program, you know, and we'd get one person trip in if we were lucky. So I changed it on Mondays when I'm doing the surf desk, and I try not to do any of my director work. I want to try to be at the surf desk and meeting people and finding out what's going on downstairs. I have from one to two, um, one-on-one -on -one resume, job help, that kind of thing. And every Monday I've had somebody come in and want help. They didn't want to come to a class. They didn't want to be in maybe with a lot of other people, or they didn't want to come um, at a certain time, but they come in Monday. And Monday happens to be a really good time because they've had the Sunday paper, they saw the one ads, and now they want to apply for that job. So uh, we've, we've had a lot more where we're helping people. Yes, this might not come in our stats. Our state doesn't let us count one-on-one -on -one programs. But but, but I don't care because what I'm trying to do in my library and I know you're trying to do is help your community and I think that one-on-one -on -one tech stuff, that one-on-one -on -one, um, job resume, job help, uh, another one-on-one -on -one thing we do is college applications, college essay. Uh, I think that's what people want and I think you're right about that. It makes a difference. Great. Well, we don't currently have any more questions that came in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take back control of the screen. If anybody has any more questions, feel free to go ahead and type them in while I am doing that. Okay, we should be back. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but I'm sure you can definitely contact Mary Beth if you have any questions after the fact. She seems more than willing to share. Um, and yes, anybody can email me at any time. I'm happy to talk loud. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for presenting. It was wonderful to hear about your success. Congratulations on your award. Thank you. Uh, for those of you in the audience, um, as I said, Encompass Live, we do this every week. So here is a look at our upcoming programs. We'd love it if you would come back and join us for another one. And thank you very much for attending.